Hello everybody and welcome to Public. I'm your host Anne Berry and here with us today is Gal Krubiner, co-founder and CEO of Pagaya, a technology company bringing AI infrastructure into the financial ecosystem. Pagaya went public via SPAC in 2021 and trades on the NASDAQ under ticker symbol PGY. Gal, thank you so much for joining us today. You're in the hot space AI and fintech, so excited to get your perspectives with us. Thanks a lot, Anne, and thank you so much for having me today. So, Gal, to get us started. Walk us through the Pagaya business model and what the problem is within the consumer uh, finance ecosystem that Pagaya has set out to solve under your leadership. You know, it's been a, it's a long journey, I know, uh, for you from inception through to the public markets and today. So, I'd love to get your perspective on that. Sure, and we'd love to do so. So, I, I think when we speak about Pagaya, maybe the first place to start with is the mission. What is the mission of Pagaya? In Pagaya, we're trying to provide more access to credit to more people more often. And by saying so, we are trying to have the ability for different lenders in the U.S. to be able to say yes to more consumers mm -hmm. when they are coming and asking the question if they can have the ability to have a loan. So the problem statement is rather easy to understand. It's the fact that even today, with the amount of technology that exists out there and the infrastructure that you have spoken on about, still 42% of the people are getting rejected or declined when they are right. asking for credit. Okay. So what we thought to ourselves is if we will have the ability to build a new infrastructure that is built on AI and will have the ability to embed it into the lenders and the banks in the US, will actually allow them to be able to approve more consumers and therefore reduce the amount of rejects consumers are getting in the U.S. and provide more credit to more people in the U.S. And so, Gal, just as so we unpack this together, what you're saying inherently assumes that that 40 plus percent of consumers who are being turned away from getting credit should be getting credit or some form. Otherwise, there isn't a problem here. So why are those consumers not getting the credit that Pagaya assumes they should have access to? So your assumption is absolutely correct. I would not say all of them, but definitely a subsegment of these 42% right. could, should get credit. And then the, the question that comes to the mind is why on earth the reason for today is for them not to get credit. Right. And the answer is lying in the way the financial system in the US has been built and developed in the last, call it four decades which a lot of it was lack of the ability to implement and to use AI, both from an infrastructure perspective and on the other side, from a modeling perspective. The best way maybe to put it is think about the revolution that the open AI created with Chad GDP. Before we do it's that, Gal, sorry, let, let's just go back and just make it a little simpler. So of that 42% of consumers, is it because they don't have FICO or credit scores that enable them to get credit? is because they're perceived to be over lever. So just very simply, what is it about that 42% right now that means they're not getting credit from the traditional banks? So this 42% has one constituents that is usually out of the boundaries. FICO can be one of them. Okay. Maybe the salary could be a different. So in the right. US today, things are working with the hard cuts. So like the difference between someone who have right. 630 FICO or 641 could be yeah. massive. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, that from a risk profile, the difference is not that big. Okay. AI can make these things. Okay. And what is it that the AI is doing? Is it looking for correlations between different variables? How is it trying to cut through that noise and cut through those hard boundaries to see if someone's credit worthy? So the beauty of AI, it doesn't come with one parameter that is taking too much into consideration. Think about it as holistic view. Yeah. Think about it as the ability to take a lot of data in-house and to be able to come up with a complete picture of the credit worthiness of a person. And with the amount of data that is available out there, both on the credit bureaus and the history that Pagaya has captured, really allow us to mm. find very good that have been declined for no reason based on one factor, as you just mentioned, right. FICO being one of them or any other like DTI, debt to income ratio or one type of a feature that could, on a traditional way, would turn them into a turn down. And so, Gal, talk to us a little bit about the data that Pagai has collected over time. So just if you could walk us through 
What are the activities? Who are the partners you've been working with? And what is the kind of data that you've been gathering for now? Is it a seven year period uh, since the inception of the business? Definitely. So from a data perspective, the basis of all the data in the U.S. is being rely on the credit bureaus in the U.S., TransUnion, right. Experian, and they are the backbone of the availability of data that you can use in order to assess consumers. Now, in addition to that, the second layer, which is a proprietary data that Pagaya has, is this vast majority of information that we are collecting while having the interaction with the different lenders we are working with, we have over 25 plus lenders in what we call our AI network, that we are currently recording all the information that is being generated from the interaction of that to be able to have the complete picture on all the people as such. So to your question, we are actively every day collecting all the information and the pricing from our lenders to be right. able to form a much more accurate and holistic picture on the credit worthy of these people. And we're talking about trillions of, 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 of gigabytes. We're talking about millions of millions of data points um, collectively on the payments history, on the attributes for, for this credit bureau. So really big data that is being fed into our market. And take us through what kinds of consumer credit. Are we talking about mortgages? Are we talking about auto loans? Are we talking about personal loans? Uh, is it credit card data? You know, just talk us through a little bit of those 25 partners. What are the kinds of consumer credit that you guys are touching? So the beauty part of what we did with our AI network is that we made it more and more agnostic to what is called different markets. So we have actually been originating loans, both on the personal loan space okay. in the US, yeah. on the auto loan space, on the point of sale space, Okay. Um, and are looking in the future into many more massive scaled markets. And you can think that, that, that the TAM of these markets together are huge. And the beauty about the, the business model that we have is that we have the ability to walk into different markets with rather low different things that we need to do and being able to be very efficient into penetrating into these markets, which is, as you said before, not that typical for a seven years old company. And, and Gal, talk to us a little bit about how you may compete with an area of fintech that's been really focused on trying to find new and different ways, including with AI, AI to sort of get greater access to credit or to financial products to consumers. So if you think about the neobanks that take SoFi, for example, a lot of their pitch has been creating accessibility through improved use of data. Where does Pagaya play in that chain? Are you competing with the neobanks? Are you a service provider to them? What's your perspective? So our, our belief and our, our values in Pagaya is to enable these players. Okay. They are amazingly very well respected and, and having a great ability to market these products, to create these financial products and to have a very wide ability of, of penetrating and having conversations and interactions with the consumers. For us, it didn't really make a lot of sense to compete with such a big organizations that have so much knowledge in their own respective space. So we thought about our business model to be more an enabler. So okay. kind of like getting into them and supporting them in the ability to do so. And SoFi is definitely a good example. When they have their ecosystem and, and borrowers that are coming their own way, SoFi is a partner on our network, which they are sending through API connection, through a technology hub into our systems and the models. And then we have the ability to approve and to bring many more consumers into their ecosystem, into their SoFi brand, which is so important for them. So Gal, from the seat that you sit in, you are touching, you know, how, what is the total number of consumers that you are gathering data from? In aggregate. So we're speaking about millions of millions of active users that we have already seen, approved and issued loans to. Um, and we're speaking about over 100 million users that we have seen in different shape okay. and form coming through our pipes in one of the other of the partners that we are we are seeing. So there is a lot of data that is being gathered um, and uniquely accessed into this unique vantage point that we are seeing. And we have millions of millions of cons active consumers already um, that we have the full history payments and behavior um, of consumer as such on our platform. So you see a lot. So from a macro perspective, and we've been in such a volatile and unusual period for macro trends that impact consumers, 
What are you seeing across that enormous data set? We've seen high inflation, we've seen high interest rates. If you look at what that's done to the consumers from whom you're gathering data over the last 18 months, what have you seen that is different about their behavior versus when you first started? So definitely the insights that we have from our platform um, is, is very unique. And I would say sometimes controversial to what people will, will believe. So if you, hmm. if, you, if you play back to the start of 2022, um, sorry, to the start of 2023, there was a very strong um, bias that people thought that the recession is just about to happen. And the high inflation is going to triple back into the consumer and the ability of them to pay. When we saw and looked into the data um, and looked on the performance and the behavior of different consumers across the auto loan space and how they are paying their auto loans and into the personal loans, it was very obvious to us that there is actually rather high level of stability. Mm. So. Definitely in the U.S. today, it's very obvious, but we saw it already at the start of 2023, that a consumer is the strong part of the economy and driving very much forward in the ability to spend and to hold on on the economy activity that is still very robust um, and, and, and stable. I would say that the one thing that we are noticing that is, has been very, I would say, more on the negative side is yeah. the credit availability. So if you think about what happened in March yeah. um, with FDB, um, and, and generally speaking with, with many lenders and, and, and mid-sized banks in the U.S. that are usually the main source for consumer credit in the U.S., yeah. they have been pulled back a lot. So if you ask the question of what is the percentage of a person to get declined, it actually has been on the rise since the start of the year. So from, if I need to summarize it from a payments and stability perspective, the consumer is actually in a better stage than people expect them to be. Yeah. But at the same time, the optionality and the credit um, availability is much lower than people tend to believe that these folks have that. So, Gal, when you think about that, then your value proposition to these lenders is to say that Pagaya's products, its use of AI can help these lenders extend credit when circumstances are unusual. And we've talked about how when the consumer circumstance is perhaps more unusual than just a simple FICO credit score could indicate. What about these institutions saying, well, we're going to use Pagaya to help us continue to extend more credit when the macro is more unusual? Have you seen that as part of your dialogue? Yes. Yeah, so actually, we announced today um, an, an, a, a partnership with Varde, which is one of the biggest asset managers in the U.S., that we together went to one of the credit unions in the U.S. that experienced that lack of liquidity. And we actually provided them with a hundred million dollar plus of availability of liquidity to be able to help them clean their, their balance sheet. And I think that speaks a lot to the business model of Pagaya, which is very stable. And if you look on the origination of Pagaya throughout time, it's very stable. And people are asking, but how can it be when different lenders and credit providers are, are, are closing their boxes? Yeah. And the very simple answer to that is that when you sit on the backside of it and therefore being able to capture a lot of like the closing credit boxes of different yeah. lenders and to be able to provide them, especially in that moment, a solution, your ability to have a very robust, steady um, business model, even in macros ups and macros down, is very sustainable. And that is really one of the reasons why lenders are choosing Pagaya to be able to make their production more steady as well. And there was a period of time, Gal, you may remember this a couple of years ago, there was a lot of conversation about uh, new companies in the financial technology space trying to increase access to products by helping firms such as lenders assess the potential borrower using not just financial data like income levels and credit scores, but also things like their social media presence, you know, other factors that are much more atypical how much have you seen the demand for that? Or do you think that was just a fad? Is Pagaya playing in, in any variables that are not purely financial to help with credit worthiness assessments? So I think the answer for that is a little bit um, bifurcated. In markets where the credit bureaus and the credit history of people are not that robust, um, in non anglo saxons countries, um, that's definitely playing a much major role um, and we know a lot about Ant Financials that is doing that in China um, and many others 
companies in more emerging markets. But when you speak about the US, UK, um, in major markets, yeah. the credit room and data is so robust and actually very regulated mm. that your ability to increase the ability to make decision of credit, anything beyond what is being approved by the regulators is very tough. So on Pagaya's Got side, it. because we are operating in the US, we are very much focused on the big data that is available and less about social medias. But we definitely seen a lot of that happening um, in more emerging markets countries. Let's switch gears a little bit, Gal. We've talked a lot about product and how you're using products to solve two sets of problems, one for the consumer, one for the, the lending uh, community. Let's go macro and let's talk about Pagaya's strategy. It was uh, rumored in the press that Pagaya had been involved in the bidding war for Green Sky, which is Goldman Sachs's consumer lending unit. Can you talk about the attractiveness of that asset and whether that's something strategically important to Pagaya? So definitely would love to touch on that. Um, let me just comment that on a broader M&A strategy scale rather than the specific of, of, of Green Sky. Um, so from, from, from an M&A perspective or an unorganic growth, you can definitely think about business models that are very much close to what we do as our next right. progression as such. Um, and, and Green Sky, which they have a little bit of a similar B2B2C model just with merchants, is very much in the realm of that next progression from that perspective. So if today mm. we are helping a lot of lenders to say yes to more consumers, there is definitely a lot of synergies of being able to say yes to more consumers on the merchant side. So mm. a POS strategy of going after that type of merchant network is very appealing for us and happens to be that Green Sky, as you mentioned, is one of the more robust um, um, networks for that there. Another example could be a Sunlight, which they have a robust um, infrastructure for installers of solar homes, which is, again, the typical progression for how we think about lenders and the next part of it. So we are still going and always going to be the b2b2c model less about the front facing of the consumer but looking for ways to expand the network outreach that we have above and beyond the lenders into merchants and others and Gal, i'm going to ask you a controversial question because i can tell you're up for it which is why not have pagaya ultimately really put its money where its mouth is which is take balance sheet risk at some point i would imagine your company will have gathered so much data and therefore, you'd have so much confidence in your ability to underwrite lending, you know, credit products to consumers. What, you know, why not start doing the lending yourselves and taking that balance sheet risk and taking the balance sheet reward? So that, that's, that's a great question that we are um, debating among ourselves. I think that in the size that we are at um, and the fact that we want to serve so many consumers and to help so many people, it's just hard to see a very clear path of how with the means that we have, um, we can actually make the impact that we can with the technology that we do. Um, but as we get bigger and, and, and growing more and more, that's something we will consider. But the real question is the impact and what is the mission? And our mission is really to allow the ability to provide access to more people. And we'll do it in any way we think is a creative. Um, so, so, so we are definitely up for the challenge. It's just like the question of like, how much more can you do in the most efficient way and making what you are strongest the front front of it? There's also the, the issue of funding, uh, Gal, and, and you, you know, you've seen a number of different cycles now, both in the private capital market, and you've lived in the shoes of founders in real startup world and trying to raise money you know, several years ago versus today is quite different. And also the public markets, let's look at the numbers. You know, Pagai went public by a SPAC in an $8.5 billion deal about two years ago. Market cap today is about $1.3 billion, not alone, both in terms of tech businesses and specifically um, SPAC uh, companies that have seen a, a big decline in market cap. But talk to us a little bit about that volatility and what you think could be the catalyst to see perhaps a different movement in Pagaya's market cap and, and a reversion to some of the scale that you had before. Yes, definitely. So as all of us are aware, like valuations, generally speaking, in, in the fintech world in these areas has moved quite substantially from the heights of 21 um, yeah. to, the, to the place where we are today. And I, I can't really comment or to know on what is the sustainable long-term multiplier of that. Yeah. Um, 
but but definitely the, the macro backstop, backdrop um, and the ability to be able to do that has created some kind of like fear or cold of feet with investors, which in our eyes is definitely the big opportunity um, that that is ahead of us. I, I, I will say that from our perspective, a lot of the catalyst is bringing more lenders to our platform and right. being able to grow more and more and consistently showing to the market that our performance, both on the funding market, as you mentioned, is sustainable and repeatable and strong. We are the biggest personal loan ABS issuer in the US and mm -hmm. we have been demonstrating that throughout the year and we believe that that will give a lot of comfort to the market to be able to see the upside that could come as part of a B2B to C model, business model that could continue to grow and to flourish into different market dynamics. Um, and, and the second piece to it is that, like, as I said, more lenders and more well-known banks are going to join us and to be able to deliver the message that there are more room and space for connectivity and AI disruption into the ability of saying yes to more consumers as part of our bigger mission and story. And Gal, just close us out on one thing here because AI is a t an acronym now that has gotten so much buzz. We've seen some companies really benefit. You almost feel like everyone wants to change their website from .com to .ai uh, to try and get some uplift there. But you know, with your background really in product, just walk us through how Pagaya's AI truly is not just, you know, fast calculations, which is, you know, the, the kind of AI that's been around for a very long time. What is the nature of the actual AI that you are using that is different and has an edge in this world? So first and foremost, I would say that the AI in Pagaya is not just like the last few months. So it's above and beyond the buzz that has yeah. been created, yeah. which we are in favor of. And we think that as more people <laughs> are aware of AI, it's going to be easier for people to use the utility and the uniqueness of that. Maybe the best way to describe the outcome of an AI and the differentiation and the ability to quantify it, um, which, is, which is not about the fast calculation as you manage, but the ability to better reflect the risk profile of people and therefore to bring more people to the mainstream economy, is lying into the number of the fact that we are actually approving 20% more funded loans for every lender that is using our okay. systems. Mm. The actually, the proof is in the pudding, which with these models, we have the ability to provide credit to 20% more people. So just think about this number of all the, the consumer credit that is happening in the U.S. And if AI could unlock 20% more access to consumers to the U.S., I think this is a very robust mm -hmm. um, uptick and meaningfully outcome for technology to serve the humankind. Though, Gal, we haven't yet seen what default rates might look like look like for that on an extended period of time, right through the maturity of those loans. So maybe the jury's still out a little bit in this one? I would argue that we have been through, through a few cycles, but it's <laughs> more in the data that we should have offline rather than um, in, on an on a, on a online chat. But we'd love to take you through and to show you that. There we go. Folks, thank you so much for joining. And Gal Krubiner, co-founder and chief executive officer of Guy, thank you so much for joining us to talk about the kind of change we're seeing in this fantastically interesting industry. That'll do it, folks. See you back here another time at Publix.